Uh, we'd like to talk about the Oaks of Kentucky. I do this for various Midwestern states, so we kind of mix slides in and out to adjust to your state. And I'd like to show you just a little bit about how oaks are related to each other, and then discuss all the Oaks of Kentucky in terms of what's what's a section they're in, how they respond to different habitats, how the habitat is with one another, uh, and answer any questions that you have. If you have a question, please interrupt me during the talk, because even if we don't finish the talk, I'd rather respond to what you're curious about then wait till the end and, and be out of time or something. So anyway, this is the, the native oaks of Kentucky. And we have really 22 species that we're going to talk about today. If you find another one, it may be, you know, one here or one there that was planted or escaped or was in one county. But for the most part, you have 22 native species of, of oaks here. Um, the taxonomic sections are basically how oaks are related to each other. Yeah. If you can't hear, please move forward. We've got plenty of seats. Or I'll yell. Yeah. I keep forgetting this microphone doesn't work for you, it just works for him, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, with, with the white oaks, we're talking about white oak and post oak and overcup oak and bur oak and chinkum and oak and all those. Um, I will symbolize those as we talk with a little white tree right up here in the corner. Uh, we have annual fruiting, which means if it flowers this spring and the flowers weren't frosted, it'll bear acorns that fall as opposed to red oaks where it flowers this spring, the little acorn that sits there and matures the next fall. Yeah. Question? No, okay. Uh, smooth, rounded lobes on the leaves. Uh, they have tyloses, which is very important for where we're standing right now because tyloses are little like hemorrhoids that grow in the outer growth rings of the tree and they seal off the vascular system to prevent leakage. So if you want to have an oak that'll, that'll carry water, carry bourbon, whatever, you use one of the white oaks. If you want one that is going to drain freely, you use a red oak, and there are advantages to that as well. But they generally have scaly bark. We have 10 species of white oaks uh, native in Kentucky. Red oaks, if you see a red oak as, as we do our talk, there'll be a little red tree up here in the corner. Now, all the white oaks basically will hybridize with one another, but none of them will cross with the red oaks, and the same is true vice versa. Uh, red oaks tend to have biennial fruit. There are two species that will have annual fruit. They don't occur here. We won't talk about those today. Uh, they have pointed lobes with a wrist there, little bristles on the ends of those lobes. Uh, they do not have tyloses, and that makes them good for treated oak, because if you want to treat that with pentachlorophenol or whatever the current compounds are, it used to be creosote, it will absorb freely into the wood and travel throughout the tree. They're much easier to use for treated wood than white oaks are. Uh, and they generally have rough bark, and there are about 12 species of those. Now, elsewhere in the country and in the world, we have golden oaks, ring cumped oaks, cerus oaks, tan oaks, which are not really true oaks. None of those grow naturally here. None of them, to my knowledge, even can be planted here except for the cerus oaks, which are an old world classification. So what we're talking about for native oaks are the two top categories. By the way, am I in your way over there? Okay, if I am, just feel free to, to move over because I'm not transparent. So I'll start out in alphabetic, alphabetical order. Quercus alba is the white oak. As you can see, it is one of the white oaks. This, according to the U.S. Forest Service, is its natural range. Now, how accurate are these maps? They, they based upon uh, all your barriums in each state and the county records where they've collected these in the wild. Sometimes they see an accounting missing, like right here. Sometimes they see one that's way up here, way out there, that was probably a planted tree or a misidentified tree. But in general, this is a pretty good indication of where these trees grow in the wild. Now, what is command central for white oak? Bingo. The bluegrass. Kentucky, the bluegrass state. You know, you're, you're right in the heart of the range. You have more diversity, more variety. And white oaks like it better here, generally, than, than any place else in the world. So this is your tree. We call it the Illinois state tree, but it really should be the Kentucky state tree. There's a young white oak fall color. Old white oak, about 400 years old. That one's about 250 years old. That's just a mile from my house. They are very statuesque, very long-lived. Uh, once they this, they're this big, they are very temperamental. They don't like to be disturbed. They don't like droughts. They don't like floods. They don't like, they want to be left alone. And right now we have a lot of white oaks this size dying in my area because of the 2012 drought. Uh, it was unusual. It was, it was a record drought. And most of the ones that are dying are near a road, in a yard. They're in some place where the roots have been compromised over the years. And they could survive in normal conditions, but they couldn't take 2012. And when the roots start to die, you get armillary and things that go into the roots. And over the next four or five years, these trees peter out. And pe people say, well, why is it dying this year? It was a wet year. Well, think back. You know, think back a couple of years. And that's what happened. 
old white oaks. This is on Martha's Vineyard. That tree is probably 500 years old. It just spreads like an old white oak. I'm using this to show the male catkins, the staminate catkins that you see here. When the leaves are about half size, uh, they come out and uh, that's where the pollen comes from. If you're sneezing from oak pollen, if you have tassels in your gutters or in your air conditioners, they're all from that. That's the male catkins of, of oaks and they all have them. This is the gudgel oak. The very first shot I showed you of that tree in fall color before we started was the gudgel oak. And it's one that I worked with some volunteer arborists. Uh, we got donations from 57 people all around the country. We just got on the web and people from Texas and Kansas City and Chicago and whatever were sending in money. Uh, we had people donate their time, donate their talents. We cleaned up the oak, we cabled it, we took off all the dead limbs. Uh, we've been working on that oak for a long time. It dates to the 1750s according to core dating. And I've been working throughout our country to try to find old veteran trees like this and restore them and get them signed like this and, and appreciated by people. And it, it's, it, make, it pays dividends. People start to become aware of what they have and then they start looking at everything that's natural around them. Quercus bicolor, we're into the bee, swamp white oak. Again, what is it? White oak. Where does it grow? Well, right now, Indiana is command central for that. But it gets into Kentucky sporadically, probably more than you see here because these little counties that don't show it just mean that no one has collected it there yet, but it's probably out there somewhere. So it's a pretty widely distributed oak tree. Typical landscape tree, about 20 years old. Older tree, about 150 years old. That tree was there when they founded the cemetery. They just built around it. That's one of the diagnostic features. If you see a white oak looking tree out in the woods, in somebody's yard, whatever, and you see that birch-like, river-like bark on the branches, bingo. It's either swamp white oak or it's a hybrid of swamp white oak, because nothing else in our area has that feature. Fall color, one swamp white oak surrounded by scarlet oaks. You know, you can pick them out pretty readily. Also notice these trees are all the same age. What tree grew the best? The swamp white oak. It's very adaptable. Uh, the root system is fibrous. It will grow in literally in swamps or in, or in areas that are seasonally wet in the spring. Sometimes those areas dry down to like brick adobe in the fall and the tree is still happy. It's a very transplantable tree as oaks go. So this is one that you see a lot in, in the landscape trade. That's a really old tree, uh, and these are marcescent for the most part. Marcescence means that oak trees tend to hang onto the dead leaves into or through the winter. And that's just a, a, a carryover from when all oaks were evergreen back, you know, before I was even born. And, and they tend to do that, and when they're in cold climates and they can't hold evergreen foliage, they'll turn brown, but they don't upsize very readily. And swamp white oak is one of these, like shingle oak and a few others, that many trees tend to be marcescent like this and they'll hold the leaves. Not all of them. Some of them are immediately deciduous, but a lot of them are like this. That's probably the biggest swamp white oak I've seen in Illinois. Uh, you may have bigger ones down here. Scarlet oak. This is the other tree that I showed you next to the swamp white oaks in the previous section. What kind of oak is this? Red oak. Where is it native? Look at Kentucky. All the upland areas, you, you don't see it along the bottomlands along the river, but you see it on the bluffs, you see it in the Appalachians, you see it in any high, dry, especially sandy or rocky soil. A lot of these young trees I'll show you are from our arboretum. They're ones that we have planted there and we know where they came from, of course. We've got provenance records. Uh, there's some mature trees. Uh, that was actually taken in Kentucky, in eastern Kentucky in the hills. Summer foliage, fall foliage. Scarlet oak is always a brilliant tree. Quercus falcata, southern red oak. This is a tree of poor upland soils. What kind of oak is it? Red. I'm not going to say that anymore, but I want you to look at these and remember that all the red ones are closely related and can cross and have certain characteristics for management and for aesthetics and so forth that are in common. Same thing with the white oaks. There is Kentucky, it is for the most part in Kentucky. Uh, you probably find a few of those in the, in the yellow areas as well. Uh, in our arboretum, about a 30 foot tall southern red oak. Uh, that's down in Tennessee at the Shiloh Battlefield. That's probably about 150 year old. That's probably a seedling from the Civil War era. 
summer foliage, and just starting to turn for, for fall color. You can identify these from Pagoda and some of the other oaks because they have this long bell-shaped base to the leaf blade. And Quercus Pagoda, or used to be Falcata variety Pagoda folia, does not have that. It just comes triangular right to the, to the stem. There's a nice old one that's probably a few hundred years. That's down in North Carolina. And you find these on uplands, you find them on sloping soils, fairly dry soils, fairly sterile soils, and they do just fine there. How many of you have seen shingle oak? Everybody, okay. You know that shingle oak's the one that has, well, one of the two that has no lobes or teeth on the leaf. They just like a, like a laurel leaf. Uh, you have it throughout most of Kentucky, again, Indiana, southern Indiana, southern Illinois, western Kentucky is kind of command central for shingle oak. There's so oh, about an 80 year old tree. There's about a 120 year old tree. They can get big. Often you don't see them big because they tend to have problems with multiple leaders and with oak wilts and with bacterial leaf scorch and with some galls. They're, they're the most disease prone, problem prone oak probably that we have in North America. When they're grown well and they're free of diseases and pests, they're just a beautiful tree. But you know, the key is to keep them that way and to get them grown properly. Any day now an ice cream is going to come along and this tree is going to go that way and go that way because nobody bothered to see that this is included bark in that joint and nobody's bothered to cable that tree. Well, when shingle oak leaves and, and willow oak as well first emerge, they come out rolled like soda straws. You see how these are tubes? And as the leaves get older, the edges start to unroll, and then you have the flat leaf shape. Unlike most of the other oaks that you find, they just come out as small leaves or they're folded and they just open up. These come out like soda straws. They're very similar to some of the tropical oaks, but very unlike the ones that we have here. Now, can you see the little guy up in the top of this one? <laughs> well, he, he, this is a shingle oak in his yard. It's a farm about 40 miles from me. And every year, his dad, and now he, and I think now his son, they have a little manhole, if you will, that goes up through the crown of this tree. They get in the ladder, they go up there, and they shear the whole thing. They've made it their little lollipop tree. And it's been going on for 30, 40 years, probably, that they've been doing this. It's a novelty. I certainly wouldn't do it. But they enjoy it, and the tree, the point is the tree is tolerant of this kind of pruning. It will take shearing a lot like some of the Mediterranean oaks will, and it'll just come back stronger than ever. That's in New Holland, Illinois. If you ever come out, I'll show it to you. That's at Harry Truman's house. The big tree that shades Harry Truman's house from the southwest is shingle oak. Quercus lyrata is overcup oak. This is the most flood tolerant, water tolerant oak that we have in North America. It will grow out with bald cypress and tupelo and swamp privet right out in, in areas that are flooded for 10 months of the year. Uh, as you can see, it's confined mostly to low areas along the rivers and some of the bottomland areas in the south. The coastal plain areas that tend to have like Congaree Swamp and so forth in the east. It's definitely a lowland tree. If you plant it, it will do just great. And like swamp white oak, it has a shallow, diffuse root system, so it's very amenable to, to culture. It's one of those that we should be growing more of in the nursery industry. Small one in our house, about, uh, again, 30 feet tall. Um, these are two mature trees right here and right here that were planted in the 1930s at Lincoln's uh, New Salem historic site near my house. And this, this whole area used to be the village where Lincoln lived when he was a man in his 20s. And eventually the village was dissolved. They moved to Petersburg a few miles away and it turned into a pasture. There were no trees there. So all the trees you see here were planted during the depression, during the CCC days when they rebuilt all these cabins on the original foundation that they found underground. And somebody decided to plant trees there. Now that tree has no business in an upland site. This is the top of a ridge. It has no business in central Illinois when it's native to swamps in southern Illinois. But I found these two trees. I also found a water oak and a couple of the trees that are now gone that we think someone brought from Lincoln's birthplace here in Kentucky because you can find them there. And if you look at these trees, they have a little bit of problem with, with frost cracking and so forth. They don't really like our winters much. They're making it, but they're, they'd rather be down here. So, you know, these again, if you look at some of these historic sites and put together the pieces, it's just fascinating to see that, that there is some initiative on the part of people 80, 90 years ago to plant something to carry the Kentucky heritage of Lincoln to Illinois. 
The leaves are sort of lyre shaped, kind of like a bur oak that's a little bit narrower and not as deeply toothed in the middle. Uh, fall color and spring color, by the way, are both generally outstanding on over a couple because one of the best of the white oaks for fall color. And these are the acorns. Have you ever seen these acorns close up? Now the thing about overcup and what it means by that is the cup comes over the nuts and grabs it. Now when an acorn falls, typically what happens, the acorn breaks loose from the cap and falls to the ground, right? And the cap falls later. Or if they fall in the ground, they hit the ground and, and break apart. Not so with these because the cap holds onto the nut. Now what's the purpose of that? Somebody's got a theory. Dave, you got a theory? Sorry to pick on you. Well, it has to do with moisture, but not to hold it in. The, the trick that I've, and again, this is my own speculation, but I've talked to a number of uh, dendrologists who concur with it, is that when this acorn lands in a flooded situation in the water, the cap floats. If it's a good nut, the nut sinks. But what happens, it lands in the water, it turns with the cap up like a life jacket, yeah. and it bobs along. And when it comes to a mud bar or some place where it can germinate, that lodges, the little tip right there, that's where the root comes out. So it lodges, it grows down, and it establishes right at the flood level of that, of that fall. So moisture, yes, but for different reasons. This is unique in all of the North American oak and its ability or, or its capability to do this. All the others tend to have caps. With a, a few bur oaks will hold on, but most of the they, they have caps that will be free from the acorn like that. Uh, I've seen them start to crack. Now, Muhlenbergii will... Short root out. Yeah, well, Muhlenbergii does that a lot, especially in a humid fall. Which one? Uh, Chinkamon oak. We'll see that in a little bit. But this one can as well. This is a big old overcup oak down in New Orleans, or near New Orleans, down in southern Louisiana. That tree is about five feet in diameter. Big, majestic tree growing right out in the middle of a cypress swamp. Bur oak. We're going to spend a little bit of time on bur oak because, you know, as you probably know, you have or at least had the national champion bur oak right here in Kentucky. There's another contender now. One's fatter, one's taller. One's, you know, they're both beautiful trees, whatever. Uh, it's at a, at a horse farm near, ne near Lexington. But if you look at bur oak, you're kind of on the southern fringe of it. You know, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, this, this is the area where it's most variable. And, and something about the natural range of a tree, when you have a tree that's down here, or up there, up there on the edge, that tree's not gonna be the same. This one won't be the same as that one. That won't be the same as that one. They look like different species. But as you go toward the center of a range, you have more diversity because this tree has sorted out to have only the best ones that are most adapted to that hot, long season climate survive and propagate. This one is adapted to have one that matures as acorns really fast, so they're very small because the growing season is so short. And it can tolerate the cold, it can tolerate the wind. It has a very thick bark for the prairie fire protection. You know, every tree is different. Here in, in this part of the range where I am, we have a big diversity of brook because we don't really have any of those extremes. So a lot of these trees have retained those characteristics. But as you get toward the edges of a range, any tree will tend to, to sort itself out so that only the best for that particular area will survive and, and reproduce. We have a, a bur oak provenance planting in our breeding. We have more than 80 bur oaks from all across the natural range. We have Western Canada, Eastern Canada, all the way down to Texas, all the way east. We plant them all together. We're doing some studies on, on phrenology, on growth rates, on bark, leaf morphology, and, and all this type of thing. These are some bur oaks about 50 miles east of where I live. You can see my wife here. You can see this tree, that one, that one. There are a dozen more back over in here. I don't know how old they are. I'll show you one later that I do know how old. Uh, but these are ancient old savanna trees that were growing there in a savanna situation before Illinois was settled. Probably from the late 1600s, early 1700s. And they're still there. At least these are still there. So if you look at bur oak, and again, just as an example of all oaks, the adaxial surface is basically the, the upper side of the leaf. It's the side that's facing the axis of growth. Adaxial just means the underside. And if you look at the underside of an oak leaf with a little loop, you can see what are, are, are little hairs. Some of them are stellate or, or starfish shaped, some of them are straight, some of them are forked. That is a really good way to identify some of these and identify if they're a hybrid or not, is to look at the hairs. Baroque acorns. Uh, I've got a big acorn herbarium at home. How many of you are going to the Oak Society Conference next, a year from this October? David, how many of you even know about it? Okay. The, the International Oak Society meets 
every three years worldwide. The last one was in France, before that was Mexico and so forth. Next year, next, next October, it's going to be in Illinois. We're going to do a five-day pre-trip throughout southern Illinois, Missouri, back into the Northern Art and Arboretum. There'll be a three-day conference with papers and a massive seed exchange if you grow oaks from all over the world. We'll probably have 25 countries represented there on a post-trip. If you don't know about it and you have an interest in oaks, get online, go to internationaloaksociety.org and find out. Join, join now. But anyway, these are acorns from burr oaks from, again, all over the native range. This one I know is Texas. That's Oklahoma. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, you know, they don't look like the same species, but if you look closely, there are acorns of all shapes and sizes. And the first people who found burr oaks way up in North Dakota called the Quercus mandanensis. The ones who found it in Texas called the Quercus macrocarpa with the, the big fruit. But when you travel between them, you fill in the voids, they just grade, they clinally grade into one another. So it's all one species, just an extremely diverse species. There's a reason the northern ones are tiny because they have such a short growing season, they can't grow big acorn, it would be empty, it would never reproduce. The southern ones are huge, because what gives the best chance of survival for a seedling? A lot of food in, in the seed, right? Especially in a hot situation like you have in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and so forth, the bigger the nuts, the better the chance for that seedling to survive and reproduce, and the more vigorous it'll be. So there are reasons for all this. Yeah? Not as much as Baroque, but yeah, yeah, you will see differences. White oak, for example, the southern white oaks tend to have shallowly lobed leaves, and northern ones tend to have more deeply lobed leaves. There are subtle differences, but Baroque is the classic example of this clinal variation because it has such a broad range and goes so far west and so far east and so far north that these differences really come out strongly. I'm using this, this again is bur oak, and I just want to show you here again are the male or staminate catkins. Now you notice where this one is coming out is right at the bud. The time that that tree starts to grow a stem, that catkin is already out there and it's already shedding pollen. Now a few days later as this is growing, this and that and that are what we call acornets, so that's the female flowers in the leaf axils. Now by the time they are ready for pollen, this pollen is pretty much gone. But the tree next door might be three or four days later in blooming, and that's all it takes, because that pollen goes to this tree. So that encourages outcrossing in oaks, not totally, I mean the tree will still pollinate itself a little bit, but it encourages these trees to genetically mix and stay diverse. And that's a, it's a real plus for oaks in, in terms of adaptation to changing climate and so forth. It's not so good for us who want to grow things, like we have 250 different oak species in our arboretum. If I pick an acorn, God knows what the pollinator was, so it's hopeless. But if you go out in the woods where there's all one species or a couple of species that generally don't cross, you can sort it out and grow them that way. But just remember, the male catkins come out first. This is called protandry because it's, the anthers are, are out first. Then a couple of three days later, you have the little female flowers that are ready to go. And then by that fall, you have an acorn, if everything worked right. This is what I call the last bur oak. This, this is in western Nebraska, almost to the state line. It's west of Bur Oak Canyon. And behind it, for the next 500 miles, is short grass prairie and subdesert. This, this little guy, about as big as a peach tree, is probably three or 400 years old. Trunk about like this, it grows about that much a year, but it's the vanguard. It's the one that says, well, if I can make an acorn grow, and I can put it over here, and it makes it, and then if that one can grow in 500 years and put one over here, slowly we're going to expand the range. If I die first, we're going to shrink the range. But that's the last bur oak. Salute it. <laughs> This is very similar to your co-champion, whatever. This is the McBain tree in Missouri. Uh, it's the one that is considered to be basically equal to plus or minus the one that, that's here in, in Paris, Kentucky. Big, beautiful old trees, both of them. Now, the life stages of a bur oak is sort of representative of, of all the oaks. You start out with a seedling. This, this was four months old, uh, a seedling that I uprooted out of our, our mulch bed. And of course, I, I broke the root off down here. It actually probably would have been six inches longer yet. But the root or hypocotyl comes out of, the tr out of the nut first and starts growing down. Then later on, when the danger of frost has passed, the plumule or the upper part comes out of the same place in the nut and goes upward. And that's what you see after maybe one, one growing season, about this time of year. There's one that's 10 years old. And that's one of those that's in our provenance planting. I know how old it is because I planted it. 
This one is 30 years old. I planted that one too. Actually, I found it as a little seedling two years old. And I know what year I found it. So I just, every 10 years, I photograph it again. I, I could do another one now. That was 10 years ago. I was going to do a 40 year old photo now. I just haven't had a chance yet. This one I chordated to 100 years. I just thought it was a nice tree. Let's see how old it was. I happened to have an increment core. I just bought it. This is, I don't know, 20 years ago. This is one of the first trees I ever tried with an increment core. And we, of course, had to extrapolate. It's basically a 100 year old burrow tree. So this is kind of what they do with the life stages, the changes in morphology, and so forth. This one is in western, well, it's central southern Iowa. It's 200 years old, again, by coordinating and extrapolation. One branch is 80 feet long, one of the, the longest side branch. Just imagine this thing as a canopy tree. You can see what's around it. This was an old savanna tree surrounded by prairie. There's a group of trees here, a couple over there, one over there. And basically, it's an open area. This one is 300 years old. That's not far, far from my house. 130 foot crown spread, 19 feet around the trunk. Big, massive, picturesque, beautiful trees. This one is 400 years old. I know the, age, the, age, the age of this because there were three of these. They were all cohorts. One of them had died and the farmer cut it off. And I counted rings on the stump. And I got to 380 years to a, to a core about this big that was hollow. So give or take that hollow, this is a 400 year old burrow tree. It's no longer there, by the way. A lightning struck it, it burned the whole tree to the ground. But they do live a long time. I mean, they're big, beautiful trees. Do burrow oaks live forever? Well, no, but do you know what happens when burrow oaks die? Well, I've, I've been doing some research on this. I've not published it yet, so keep this to yourselves. But what happens when burrow oaks die is they go there. <laughs> Onward. Quercus merylandica, blackjack oak. This is again one of the red oaks. Now as you can see it's a southern tree, uplands, poor soils, solid clay, half inch of soil over bedrock, dune sand, and this is the tree. Now what are these two doing over there? Who knows? You know they probably were misidentified, somebody planted them. You just scratch little records like this. But this one maybe, that one probably, and there are probably a few more in there that just haven't been recorded or collected. They don't like our pH. No, you, you need to have a, a more acidic pH. Now, all of Kentucky is not pH of 12. I mean, you've got places. Yeah. Well, the bluegrass, but you can, if you can find areas where you can grow those things. Yeah. Uh, this is the typical form of like a 40-year-old tree. As you can see, one is marcescent, one is not. This was taken, I believe, in March. You can still see a little bit of lingering snow in late winter. Uh, but if you grow them and they're not mutilated by deer or by farm equipment or whatever, they have a nice little globular symmetrical form like that. This is growing on a sand prairie in central Illinois. I don't know how old that tree is. It's probably pretty old. Here's the summer foliage and the fall foliage to die for. This is on the Oklahoma-Texas border. And all the little brown things that you see in here are blackjack oak. You know, you have red cedar, you have cactus, you have short grass prairie, you have bare rock with a few cedars on it, and you have blackjack oak and a few post oak. They are tough as nails. Now, they, they say they grow slowly, but they grow just as fast as any other oak. It's just that 90% of it is underground because they want to establish a root system that explores every crevice and it goes to a broad area. They grow in really severe habitat, and that's how they survive. Nothing else where they grow can grow fast. They don't have to worry about being shaded up by something else. They just have to worry about survival, and that's how they do it. These and post oak grow side by side. They're both really slow growing, long lived, iron wooded species, uh, and beautiful landscape plants if you're willing to tolerate the slow growth, and if you can grow them in a containerized system or a root pruning bag system that will give it a good root structure. That's a big problem with a lot of oaks, and especially with ones like this. That's another one from the sand prairie. That's typical bark, and again, the spring flowers. If you look closely, you can see little acornets forming right there, and, and well, you can't really see it, there's one right there. Uh, that's the same sand prairie again, but that's what they look like in the spring. This is the Kirby Oak. It's the largest black jack oak in our county. It's about a little over three feet in diameter. Not far off from being the Illinois state champion black jack oak. They don't get large unless you wait a thousand years. But they are very picturesque trees, very colorful trees, hardwooded trees. Great for landscape if you're willing to wait. 
swamp chestnut oak, basket oak, swamp chinkapin oak. Again, it tends to be more in floodplains, not in swamps like, like the uh, overcup oak is, but it tends to be in floodplains that will flood and drain down right away. You can see the range there, all the low areas. In our arboretum, about a 40 foot tree grown from seed from Southern Illinois. That's the parent tree that the seed came from. That's back when I still had dark hair. That was 1923, I think. <laughs> Summer foliage, beautiful sort of translucent, uh, heavily lobed, and not lobed, heavily toothed tree. And then the fall color is, is probably the best of all the white oaks for fall color. The thing about it is you'll have scarlet leaves and a few green leaves on the tree at the same time. So it's like a Christmas tree, you know, red and, red and green. And it always has that. By the time these leaves fall, these are red. But for the most part, the most colorful time is the red, red and green mixture on those. That's a large one, you know, Torsha Lake in Southern Illinois. That's 140 feet tall. These trees get enormous, they're hardwooded. They usually have a good branch structure. You don't have to worry about them too much with growing double leaves and things like that. They live to a big ripe old age and they're just majestic trees. Some of the biggest oak trees in North America are swamp chestnut oak. Another of the chestnut oaks, if you will, rock chestnut oak or Appalachian chestnut oak. This is the upland variety. This, this is in the Appalachian Mountains, Hoosier National Forest, you know, and in some of the upper areas of Kentucky. Uh, and even up into here a little bit, although some of these records I suspect again might be wrong. Stargill Forest, uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, summer foliage again. You notice it's very similar to Swamp Justin Oak, but they're even a little bit more crenate. They're more wavy as opposed to having the, the, the sharper teeth. Very subtle, but there is a difference. You can identify them by the leaves. The bark, this is a white oak, but it has bark like a red oak, doesn't it? In Europe, that's common, but here, that's the only white oak that we have that has bark like that. If you see a white oak with that bark, you know immediately what it is. And there's an older one. I took it because of the burrow, but you can again see the bark. Looks, looks just like northern red oak out in the woods until you look up at the leaves. There's the acorn. And again, you can see the uh, crenate lobing on the, or toothing on, on the margin of the leaf. Quercus Muhlenbergii is the other one of our common chestnut oaks. So they call them chestnut oak because the leaf is just sort of undulate, look, kind of like a chestnut leaf as opposed to lobed or, or whatever. Uh, here again, boom, there's Kentucky. This tree loves alkaline soil. When you said you couldn't grow blackjack oak, Dave, you can grow this one. And some of the biggest ones in the world are down here in Kentucky. They're just massive trees, beautiful trees. Um, that's one at the Chicago Botanic Garden, planted there. It's, what, 20 feet tall or so. Typical young tree form. Uh, this is one in Springfield, Illinois. We have a few calcareous areas in Springfield along the south part of the city, and that's where you find all these. With hackberry, with black walnut, with sugar maple, uh, with Kentucky coffee tree, all the calcifitic trees tend to grow together in, in forest areas. That's another one along Lake Springfield. This is a big old open grown, you know, 250 year old sprawling magnificent tree. It'll probably be there another 250 years if somebody doesn't get careless with a lawnmower and girdle it. The leaves are narrower. They used to be called Quercus acuminata because the leaves are much narrower than the other chestnut oaks. They have that whitened underside, but otherwise they're very similar. This is Quercus muhlenbergii that's full of burls. And I used to take tree tours to this tree. I don't know how old it was, a couple hundred years old. A little old lady lived in the house there. And I'd knock on the door, can I show people your tree? Oh, sure, come on. We go in the backyard and, you know, beautiful burls. It's one of a kind. You don't see trees like that again. Well, one day I came there and knocked on the door and somebody else answered. And I said, where's Mrs. whatever her name was? Oh, she, she sold the house. We own it now. Oh, well, I'm so-and-so. Can I show people the tree in your backyard? He said, what tree? Uh, well, you know, the big old burly chink of an oak. Oh, well, it looks sick, so we cut it down. <laughs> educate people. Every chance you get, go out there and educate somebody. You know, make them aware of that. This is here in Kentucky. This is, or at least was, the national champion 22 feet circumference chink of an oak. 
it was saved because the landowner who owned that wanted to cut it down and bulldoze this out for pasture. And a retired Kentucky State Forester was his neighbor and said, well, if you'll leave it alone, I'll clear out around it so the cows can still graze under it, I'll protect it, and we can still have the tree and the cows can sit under it for shade. So the farmer said, okay. Well, the farmer's long dead, but the tree is still there. That's what we need to do. Kill the people and save the trees. <laughs> Crocus nigra water oak. This doesn't quite, in, quite get into Illinois. Some people claim it is, but there's a few planted trees. But as you can see, it's darn close. It barely gets into Kentucky, too. And that one, I think, is the false reading. But you can plant it here. Get seed from the northern edge of the range, and it will grow just fine for you. You can move these trees a little bit. Don't get seed from down here. You know, it's the same with anything, isn't it? There are some nice old water oaks in South Carolina and Georgia. And, uh, that one's in Louisiana. The leaves of water oak, I'm sorry this is not quite in focus. Can you, can you guys see it all right? I don't know how to focus that thing or I would. Uh, but the leaves, this is a leaf of water oak, which as you can see still has fall color. This is about Thanksgiving. All the other leaves on, our, on the ground are, are already totally brown. Yeah, that's great, thank you. He's a good man, isn't he? Let's give him a hand. <laughs> He's been running this whole show for all the day. And what's better yet is that for us, some of them are evergreen, even up here in Arboretum. This is a Star Hill Forest, Zone 5, Central Illinois. Every tree, this is January. Look at this evergreen oak. Look at it with snow on it. We have pictures with ice on it. Every other tree is not only brown, but most of them have already lost their leaves. Even the Marcescent oaks have lost their leaves. But some of these water oaks are evergreen. And we find an evergreen oak that has good form, not multiple liters, but good central liter form, which this does, that's hardy in zone five, which this is, that's gonna be our next named oak cultivar. We've just been watching it for a number of years to make sure it would, would stay true, and it has been. These are just two big old trees in Louisiana. Um, this is at the home, home of the chairman of the Live Oak Society in Metairie, near, near New Orleans. Uh, this one is at the other side of New Orleans. This is about a 20 foot circumference tree. You know, we think of water oak as being a ratty, decrepit, short-lived, split-apart, Bradford pear type tree, and a lot of them are. But when you find the one that has that good central leader, that has those wide-angle branches, that has everything going for it, they get to be like this. Don't sell it short just because most of its kin are scrap. You know, there's, there's, there's black sheep and there's white sheep, and this family has more black sheep, but occasionally you find the white one. Quercus natalii. You know, some of the silly taxonomists are calling it Quercus texana. As you can see, it barely even gets into Texas. The reason they do that is that somebody messed up herbarium records, and a guy from Cornell found that they put the wrong label on the wrong specimen, so he took that as a chance to name an oak. We're no longer going to call it Quercus natalii. We're going to call it Quercus texana. And the one we used to call Quercus texana, we'll call Quercus bucklei. And on, 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 on. Most of us, we just say, you know, Quercus natalii, there's only one species that that name can apply to, even if he doesn't agree with it. Quercus Quercus texana can be this, it can be Quercus buckley, it can be Quercus gravesi, it can be Quercus, uh, there's a fourth one they all used to call Quercus texana. It should be thrown out as nomen and big one. I'll stop the preaching there except to say that it's my feeling that all the taxonomists in the world and concrete blocks and the ocean in combination are a really good start. <laughs> This is the Ortet tree of one that we've selected for a cultivar because it has beautiful spring and fall color. That's, that's, that's out of rest area in Missouri. The building is now down, but we persuaded the DOT to save the tree. Uh, there's another one that's growing down in Mississippi, I think. I have to look up on the slide to be sure. The typical foliage of Nuttall's oak is like pin oak, but with maybe an extra lobe or so. It's a little bit longer, a little bit more on steroids. This is the cultivar we selected from that tree I just told you about at the rest area. This is the spring color, which lasts for two or three weeks in the spring. This is the fall color, and this is the only Nuttles oak that we have found that's been totally reliably hardy in our climate. I've gotten them from Mississippi, Tennessee, Louisiana. They live for a couple of years and a bad winter comes along and they either die or they're so decrepit they have to take them out. This one has never died back, even in this, this last winter that we had. No tip damage, nothing. I think there might be introduction from pin oak into this thing. We're going to do some genetic research at the Morton Arboretum to find out. But in any case, this is New Madrid Nuttles Oak. If you, if you see this listed in the nursery catalogs, that came from this tree. New Madrid, yeah. New Madrid, Missouri is where it came from, which is an outlier population at the very northern edge of the range, which helps with the hardiness. 
Uh, they're, they're not real fussy. They're, they're nothing like pin oak. You know, I don't know. What is your pH, Dave? What is it, Seven, five, eight? If you're in the sevens, they should do okay. I mean, you get into eights, I mean, that's, that's hell for anything. Except for chinkum and oak and bur oak. But yeah, chinkum and bur oak will take that. But this will take any reasonable, you know, soil pH. It will, this, again, is a swamp tree. It will thrive with water over the first couple months of the year. Not as much as water oak, but, or, or as a over a couple oak, but almost as good. It'll also grow on high upland soil. We've got these planted on a south-facing top of a bluff. We've got them planted in a floodplain. You can't tell the difference. They all look like the same tree. And this is how you can tell pin oak from nettles oak, not only by the leaf size and shape, but a pin oak acorn is small, flat capped. A nettles oak is a little longer with a deep cup. And also these will turn almost to purplish black when they're ripe. Pin oak is brown and striped. So when you go down south along the Mississippi Valley and you see these with that kind of an acorn, you, you know automatically that's not pin oak, that's, that's this other one. This was the Illinois State Champion, Nuttles Oak, uh, which I found in 1972. It, it had been unknown in Illinois until I found it, and there were four of them in this nature preserve. The tree was 20 feet around the trunk. Well, it broke off, and we found out that 60 years ago, somebody had filled the hollow with concrete. And you can see right here, there's, there's a broken bottle. Well, somebody filled it with concrete, and they, they put a bottle with a message in the bottle and threw it in there and poured more concrete on top, but it rolled down to the edge. So when the part of the tree fell away, we saw that. This was the mason jar. We broke it and took out the, the message that was signed by all the guys who did the concrete work uh, just after World War II. So I've still got that frame. This is the current Illinois champion that I was old, because one of the three that are left of, of natural origin, but most of them tend to be from the boot heel of Missouri on south and always in the Mississippi Valley. Cherry bark oak. Again, one of the largest oaks you'll find. It's, it's a denizen more of the swampy areas and the, and the floodplain areas and the lower parts. And you'll see it grows only in the, in the lower eastern or western parts, not so much in the upland parts of your state. Same thing here, it grows just in the south edge down in the swampy areas. That's one in our arboretum. A very rapid growing, very beautiful straight excurrent trunk to it. Really nice performing tree. Can you see me at the base of that one? That's a 24 foot circumference. That's drawn to central Arkansas. That's what they can get like, given not all that much time. Really. That tree probably is not 200 years old. They grow rapidly, they grow to a beautiful specimen. That's our Illinois state champion tree. Uh, again, in a swamp forest down in, in the deep southern Illinois. Big, majestic, fast growing, wonderful timber trees. And there we are measuring another one. Whenever you have European tours, they always have to measure everything. I don't, I don't even know how big it was, but they always, oh, let's measure They got the tape and they run around it and they're breaking notes and they're taking pictures and they're just smiling. The Japanese are the same way. We had a Japanese guy in there. He was just jumping up and down with excitement. So happy. So they call it cherry bark oak because the bark sort of looks like black cherry. It has the little, little ridges that peel a little bit. Very different from most of the other oaks that look anything like it. Black oak and, and falcata and so forth don't have bark like that. And this is a hollow cherry bark oak, and I'm inside of it. Can you see this, this stone down here? This is the American Cemetery in Natchitoches, Louisiana that was formed in like the 1600s. And at the time, they, they made this a cemetery because this had been a former Indian graveyard. And this was the stone to mark the grave of an Indian princess back then. The tree came up next to the stone. It grew around the stone. It totally enclosed the stone. So for a couple hundred years, nobody could see the stone. It was inside the tree. Then the tree got lightning damage or whatever. It started to hollow out. And all of a sudden, there she is again. Just a fact, I don't know if that stump is still there. It was a tree with about two light branches last time I was there about five years ago. But, you know, trees have fascinating stories if you go and interpret them and listen to the language. Typical foliage in the outline, it looks sort of like a pagoda. That's where it gets its name. Pin oak. You, know, you probably don't do pin oak well down here. I mean, you know, if you don't have a pH of two for your pin oak. We have problems in Illinois, too. It shows that native in every county that's bogus. You know, it's planted in every county. You know, they may have found it in somebody's pasture because someone planted one there and it escaped. Uh, but it tends to grow in the acidic soil areas, generally in flatwood situations where it can get some seasonal water. That's one in our arboretum. This one was planted in 1828 at Hurricane Farm in Carlinville, Illinois. We know when the house was built and there were workers that planted a pin oak in the front yard and, and this is it. It used to have branches going down to the ground on all sides. This was on the roadside, so they took all, all these off, but they left those on that side. 
So it can be a big, beautiful old tree. You can see the X current branching, you know, straight, tall trunk if it's well grown, double leader if it's not, you have to watch them. This is a little gnome-like uh, something globe, I forget the name of it. This is in Belgium and it's being grafted on a standard to make a lollipop tree. Uh, that's my friend Bert Dirk Benoit, who he handles all of our cultivars for Europe. I was touring a nurse and said, what the heck is this awful thing? Oh, that's a wonderful tree. And then he starts telling me about it. And so he grows red oaks to a six or seven foot standard, grafts a little lollipop on top. Everybody wants them, go figure. Some people have no taste. Anyway, the, the, the foliage you can see is like nettles oak, but only basically has five lobes for the most part. And they're very right angled to the tree. Uh, so a lot of times it's planted around new houses and it is marcescent. Again, it has those leaves that cling in the winter but you can also find it planted around old houses. This house dates from the 1870s. The tree was planted there. When the house was built, the tree is still there. And later on, if you're around later this afternoon, I'll show you that same tree from the other side. Remind me to remind you of that. Willow oak, uh, we just barely, barely have. It doesn't show it in Illinois, but there are about five trees right down there in that one county. So I count it as Illinois native. And when I grow my trees, I grow them from that population because it's a northern source and they do fine for us. As you can see, Kentucky, in the southern half at least, is pretty common. It's very commonly planted. It's a wonderful tree for uh, horticulture. It's easily transplanted, easily pruned. It makes a nice excurrent form when it's young, like that one in our arboretum. Uh, it can get to a good size. It can get to a massive size. This is the Arkansas State Champion. It has these soda straw leaves, just like shingle oak. Okay. Remember how they would tend to be emerging as tubes? and then the edges would unroll into a flat leaf. It's a very narrow flat leaf, but they come out as tubes first, almost like pine needles. That's when the leaves are unfurled. They're still not very wide. And a good willow oak that's not been pollinated by something else, and you can tell if they have a lobe, they're not pure willow oak, they've got something else going on. But it'll have leaves that are maybe just a half inch or slightly wider by, say, five inches-ish long. That's fall color. It's one of the better of, of these types of oaks for fall color. Quercus rubra, a close relative, very common throughout Eastern North America. We've got it, you've got it, every state in the eastern half of the country has it. Large tree, that's a 45 year old tree at our arboretum. It's 70 feet tall, this big. That's a Civil War era tree at our arboretum. I know because the nice drum took it out and I counted the rings and it dated to 1860. Emerging foliage, not always, but often, will be pink to bright red like this. In the spring, when you see these things first leaf out, you can still see the structure of the trees, but this little red haze. White oaks tend to be pink or white. Red oaks tend to be red. Black oaks are a dark fuzzy red. It's a beautiful time of the year for three or four days. Go out there and, and enjoy it. The mature leaves, like this, and red oak in a, in a cultivated setting. These were old trees when the town was built. They just made the sidewalk go around them. They had the street right here. And surprisingly, the trees are, are still there. What arborist in this room wants to make a bet that those trees would have survived all that? You know, they did. This was planted at Pilnitz Palace in Germany in 1779. And it is the most commonly planted American oak throughout Europe. It's naturalized in Europe. It's almost a weed in Europe. It just loves Europe. Schumard oak. It's very similar to red oak. It has deeply cleft leaves. It tends in our area to be a little bit more restricted to lower soils. When you get out in Oklahoma, it's up in the mountains. I think it's probably a different species, but the taxonomists don't recognize it yet. Beautiful fall color. This is the national champion Schumard oak. Can you see me down here? Can you see this tree? Massive, massive trees. And in the east where they tend to grow in the low areas, they will get to be that big. Here, here's the same tree from the side. That's me by it. I'm two meters tall, so you can do the math. That's the spring foliage first coming out. Summer foliage developed and fall foliage. Yeah. Why not plant a Schumard oak? This even of the red oaks is the one that can tolerate high pH better than any of the others. You know, go for Schumard oak. Post oak, you plant this for your great grandchildren, but it is a magnificent long-lived tree, native everywhere but only in poor soils 
high soils, post oak flats, things like that. Uh, here again, this is that same area on the Texas-Oklahoma border. We call it Pink Rocks. Now, this is a little post oak right here. It's probably a few hundred years old. Back in here and back in there, you have a couple blackjack oaks, a few red cedar, than just bare rock with lichens on it. That's a tree in Giant City State Park in Southern Illinois. Uh, we don't know how old this is, but it had its twin that had died, and we counted more than 400 growth rings in, its, in a tree next to it that was the same size. Post oak foliage, post oak acorns, and it tends to produce a lot of acorns, and generally has a more reliable crop than some of the other white oaks that we have. This is at a, a historic church in Missouri. This is the tree that I used from the other angle to make our, our logo for Arboretum. If you look at our Arboretum website, you'll see a stylized tree. It, it, it came from this. Black oak, and we're near the end. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good, okay, good, because I want to talk a little bit after this. Black oak, as you can see, what's command central for black oak? Boom, right here, right here in Frankfort, Kentucky. You are the geographic center of the world for black oak. You probably have more diversity here than anywhere else. If you get up there into Wisconsin or Michigan or you get down into here, all you have are the trees that survive those particular extreme circumstances and they are a very narrow genetic pool. Here you have broad genetic diversity that's more adaptable to changes much more readily than those others are because it has all these different genes and if our climate changes, if, if whatever changes, you have the genes here to adapt to that situation. Uh, black oak in a cemetery, typical of the, the form. A larger one, this is about five miles from my house. Uh, not the biggest by far, but they, they do get huge. A lot of times they will tend to have form that tends to have a big branch tear out and then they decay right before your eyes. They don't have much decay resistance, but if you can grow them structurally sound so they don't have weaknesses or if you cable those weak branches, you can make them live a long, long time. Again, this tree has the velvety red leaves when it first comes out in the spring. Red oak that we just showed you had smooth red leaves. This one is velvety and if anything is more crimson, the other one is more scarlet. You also have the male catkins on black oak and these tend to be the largest, showiest male catkins of any oak that we grow in our area. They can be this long when the pollen is ripe and is not ripe here. It's just this bright yellow. You have this bright yellow haze and it's a calm day and all of a sudden the wind blows. You have this yellow cloud going through everything. If you're allergic, you stay in the house. But if you love trees and you love color and you love this yellow snow in, in spring, go out there and, and, and you know, soak it up and enjoy it. That's the foliage. Uh, this is a pretty deeply dissected specimen. Yeah. What's the best ID characteristics for that as a mature? Uh, a combination of the bark, the big brown fuzzy buds. If you find an acorn, it's a dead giveaway because the acorn cap has the scales that are all like, like the shingles that blew up in the wind. They're not detached at the base. They're not oppressed. Uh, there's a lot of little things. The inner bark is yellow, but I don't want to scrape it to find the inner bark. They're, if you have a twig and it's a vigorous twig from the, from the sun, it's pretty easy to tell just from that. Typical fall color, sometimes they're a little darker, sometimes they're more bright yellow. It's not the best fall color tree, but it's not bad. This is one that we selected, which is now coming on the market, called Oak Ridge Walker. It's from Oak Ridge Cemetery, where I do a lot of volunteer work. Look at the leaves on this thing. I mean, have you ever seen a more dissected black oak? Now, black oak is really variable. They've selected several varieties in Europe for huge leaves, for leaves that have almost no lobes or whatever. No one has yet selected a deeply dissected one like this. And there are others out there. But this one is a nicely shaped tree. It's got the leaves going forward. It's in an area that I've been watching for a number of years. You know, it's been good, dependable fall color every year. There's a lot of things in its favor. So we thought if we're going to pick a deeply dissected black oak, let's take this one. We named it Oak Ridge Walker because from Oak Ridge Cemetery shades the Walker grave. Go figure. Not Hiram Walker. <laughs> now, we have one little tree that I call the Mystery Oak of Illinois. Well, I'll tell you, it's a white oak. And let me show you. Dwarf Jacob and Oak, here is the map. According to the U.S. Forest Service, this is where Dwarf Jacob and Oak grows. Yeah. Every place in Kentucky has it. How many places in Illinois have it? <laughs> Iowa has it, Missouri has it, Indiana has it, Arkansas, you know. Where's ours? We want ours. I have looked at every herbarium in Illinois. Anything that's been identified as Dwarf Jacob and Oak has been misidentified. 
no one has found it in the wild. And it's restricted to, to sand dunes and barrens and places that we don't have many of in Illinois. But there's got to be one out there someplace, and I'm going to find it. So, you know, if you look and you know, what's happening there, why don't we have it? Well, by the time, before I'm dead, we will be able to fill in the map like this. We'll say, yeah, we have one too. But this is our little shrubby oak. And if we have other shrubby oaks in the tropics and out east, you have bear oak and so forth, Georgia oak. But this is the shrubby oak for the central part of the country. That's what it looks like. It can get a little bigger. The national champion, which I found in Nebraska, is about a foot in diameter, maybe 20 feet tall, like a little peach tree. It's the biggest one ever found anywhere. But this is more typical. And they vary a lot. There's probably a lot of introgression from other trees. But the typical form is a suckering shrub, you know, maybe six to 12 feet tall. The leaves look like chink of an oak. The flowers are just, just really, really dense. I mean, this is one of the most densely flowering of any of the oaks that we have. If you notice, these leaves are reddish instead of the yellow of chinkaman oak. And how many lobes do you see here? Very few. How many, how many veins? You know, fewer than nine. Chinkaman oak always has many more veins like that. It has more finely dissected teeth. It's a longer, lobe, a longer leaf to it. You will find hybrids between this and chinkaman oak that are intermediate. But the true species are distinct. Would chink pen and dwarf chink pen hybridize them? They can't. Yeah, I found them in the wild where the two grow side by side. Generally, one is sent out in the prairie and one is in the woods. And right along the edge, you will see some that are intermediate. Uh, but if you get them from a, from a grove, that's several of those trees, they'll pollinate themselves. So I'd like to leave you with some, some final thoughts from people who know much more about trees than I do. <laughs> And while those are loading up, can you all read those? <laughs> well, what, what he's saying is, Mr. Wilson, Joey likes your tree, and I like your tree, and Ruff really likes your tree. And I could spend the rest of my life right here under this tree, at least until dinner time. And Mr. Wilson says, this tree's as old as he is, but Mrs. Wilson says the tree's in a lot better shape. And finally, well, the reason you're having such a meager yield as maple syrup is because what you got here is the end of oak trees, yes sirree. <laughs> and that's true. Now before we take questions, I want to just mention something that I saw on my way here yesterday. Because the next man up, who is from the best college in the world, Purdue, my alma mater, is going to tell you among other things about ash bars and things to do about them and what to watch for. When I was driving here, I came through Louisville and I came through Shelbyville. And of course, you know, dead ash trees, miles and miles of dead ash trees, just depressing. We have ash war with them, two counties of us right now is not there yet. But then I saw this great big grove of dead ash trees. There's this one ash tree right in the middle, bright green, vigorous, full of leaves. I'm doing seven miles an hour, I'm doing like this. I got a semi right behind me honking at me. I thought, my God, what's that? So I, I slowed down, I let them pass. And this side of Shelby Fall, I found another one. A one really healthy ash tree in the middle of a grove of dead ones. Now, what does this tell you? as nourishment and landscapers. What should you be doing? When you find something like this, go out there. Go out there right now while the trees have leaves. Find these survivors. Propagate them. Graft them. See, who treated that tree? That's the thing. They, they were in a place where no one would treat it. It was up on a, on a, on a side of a road cut in the middle of nowhere with, with kudzu and, and honeysuckle under it. You know, that's the thing is nobody treated it. You can't go in town and find them because they've been treated. But find these survivors. And, you know, find the survivors, propagate them. If you were the guy, if you were the guy who is the first boar resistant ash tree, you can retire on Cadillacs, right? Because ash are such a, a wonderful nourishment miracle tree. And if you find another one, you find another one, you start crossing them and increasing that resistance through genetic mixing, you've solved what would take nature probably 10,000 years to do on our own. You guys are nurserymen, you guys are in the field, you know this. I'm telling you, I saw them on one drive when I was tired. I already driven for six hours, my God, there it is. Go out there, you know, spend the time, drive slowly, have a couple of people with you with spotters, note your GPS location when you find them. You're on an interstate, but you have to go back on the back roads, get to that tree, get permission if you have to, or if they're on the highway right away, propagate them, do what you can. Okay, enough of that, questions? This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.